So I've spent a majority of my career uh, focusing on the intersection between uh, sensors, neuroscience, and the built environment, meaning the buildings that we live in, play in, and, and work in. And what, uh, what I'd like to talk about today is how those things impact our everyday life. But before I do, I want to share with you what I think is arguably the uh, best creation that I've ever made, that I've ever been a part of, and it just so happens to fit on a single slide. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is my six month old daughter, Sloan. Uh, and I, I promise you, I didn't uh, just put her up there to elicit a warm reaction to you know, make you more receptive to my talk, but if that works, you know, all the better. Um, no, I'd, I'd like to be as bold as to suggest that, that we can learn more about how to improve our built environment by following the journey of a six month old than perhaps the combination of hundreds of the leading textbooks on the subject. And by the way, this is normally what I'm used to working with. Anyway, <laughs> but. Um, so similar to the building that we're all sitting in right now, Sloan went through a couple uh, critical periods of construction as she was coming to life. And so to this building that meant things like laying the foundation and erecting the interior and exterior walls and electricity, plumbing, uh, HVAC, those types of things. But uh, there's one key thing that this building didn't go through during that process that Sloan did. So as early as when Sloan was just a fetus, she was creating her, she was building her brain and she was laying down what are called neural pathways between her sensory organs and her brain. And those neural pathways act as basically information highway between what she's sensing in her external world back to her brain. And then her brain are, is using those, th those inputs basically to govern how she's going to physically and mentally react to that stimuli. And so now hopefully Sloan is more like her mother than me, but likely when she's growing up, if she's anything like me, she's going to do something like see a hot stove with that you know, hot orange circle on the top and she's gonna wonder what that is and she's gonna stick her hand up and she's gonna touch it. And she's gonna find out pretty quickly through uh, her sensory organs that that is painful. And before she's even conscious of it, she's going to remove her hand. And, and it's because of that intricate neural network that is, is providing her brain that, with that information that she's able to do that. And she's doing that because her brain is telling her body that if she doesn't remove that, she's either gonna experience further pain or potentially die. And so what, what I think we can gain from that is that if she didn't go through that process, if she didn't create that neural network, uh, that would be difficult for her to survive um, and, and she might not be able to if she didn't have that. And so now back to the physical world. We spend 90% of our entire lives inside of a building. And I, I actually contemplated putting this so early in the presentation because sometimes when I remind people of this, they get up and walk outside. So <laughs> I appreciate that everyone's staying s seated. Um, uh, so we have to pose the question that if we can't survive as a species unless we had this connection between our sensory organs and our brain and, and the fact that we have a brain, then why haven't we built that for the, the built environment? Why, why don't our buildings have a brain? Why don't they have something that imitates this neural network that we've built in our mind and our body as we've continued to grow? Now, it's not all completely lost, right? So there, there's a lot of effort towards uh, this pursuit of intelligent physical space. And as the term suggests, uh, cognitive architecture is this idea or this understanding that the physical space has such a profound impact on our cognitions and on our emotions and on our well-being uh, that, that it needs to be the, the subject of study and that we need to better understand it, which is something that we're doing today, uh, which is a good first step. Uh, so take, for example, in 1943, when the Germans destroyed the chamber in London, uh, London's House of Parliament. When it was getting rebuilt, Winston Churchill insisted that it was rebuilt in the same exact shape and format as before it was destroyed. And what's important about that is the, the shape was a, a long rectangle with two rows of benches facing inward. Um, and he insisted that it get built that way because it encouraged that two opposing party system that, uh, that constituted the backbone of British parliamentary um, uh, democracy. So he felt that the space itself and the way it was laid out, just the way that the people were going about their lives in that space, 
would make such a big impact on the rest of the country that it be laid out that way and studied that way. So uh, another interesting, uh, another great example of this is, uh, comes from uh, the famous Harvard psychologist Ellen Langer. Now Ellen, her team, what she did, which was, was really interesting, is she took a group of participants, uh, they're gentlemen in their late 70s, early 80s, uh, she took them out of the nursing home and she rebuilt an environment that was akin to 1959, which was when these participants were much younger, so when they were in their 20s or 30s. And that was the only thing that she did. Right? And she, she put these participants back into their environment and she let them go about their daily lives. Uh, as you can see, you know, black and white television, uh, all the other things that uh, come from that. I didn't live in that era, but you get the idea. Um, <laughs> and what was interesting is she measured their physical and mental signs of aging before and after this. And it was almost as though the participants uh, reversed in age or got younger. And so after just a week, uh, things that were physical like uh, their joint flexibility, uh, the length of their fingers, which has to do with the severity of arthritis, um, their manual dexterity, all those types of things. Every single participant ranked higher after just a week, um, as well as even on the intelligence side. So they took intelligence tests after, and 63% of the participants tested higher, and that was after a single week. And the only thing that they changed was the makeup of the physical environment. And that encouraged these guys to talk to each other differently, to act differently, to move more youthfully, and it had a profound impact on their physical and mental health. So if we really want to breathe life into this physical world that we live in, uh, we can't just stop at cognitive architecture, right? We can't just stop at the idea that we know that it impacts us and then hope that, uh, that we interact with it well. Uh, we need to be able to build the system that allows for the building to work with us, right? We need to build sensors that allow the building to speak to us to make adjustments and to improve so that we can improve our everyday life. So going back to Sloan for a minute, and this isn't Sloan, but um, uh, so going back to her for a minute, what, what we were talking about earlier um, with respect to the neural networks that she was building and the reactions she was making, that, that's all part of a process called developmental neuroplasticity. And so just like plastic that you can, you can mold, our brains are molding it differently and rewiring themselves uh, with all the experiences that we're having, right? So she's experiencing more and more things and those, she's reorganizing those neural pathways and she's doing that because she has more information, she has more accurate information and that allows her to govern her movements and her thoughts uh, more appropriately towards uh, what she's experiencing from her external world. She's also going through something called apoptosis. And that's when a neuron does, not, does no longer uh, send or receive any important information. It eventually gets damaged and dies. And I think that that's an important concept to think of too when we start thinking about solving problems with data is that we, we tend to think today that the more data we throw at it, the better and, and the, the easier it'll be to solve that problem. Uh, but I think we need to take a page out of our own book on how we built our bodies and built our minds. Um, and be able to get rid of useless information that doesn't actually help build a better life for us. But unfortunately, we have this, this sort of uh, skewed relationship uh, or flawed relationship with uh, third-party systems using behavior data to you know, make our lives better. Uh, a great example of that is uh, social media and, and other sort of digital emotional repositories like uh, Facebook, where we're, we're supposed to get a better experience out of it because they're tracking our every move. And uh, I, th I hope everyone understands that if, if we're not paying for it and they're capturing that information and our lives aren't really better for it, then we're more the, the product, right? We're, we're, our behavior data is getting sold to other third parties that are influencing actions that might not actually make our lives any better. Um, and so, you know, call me overly optimistic, but I think we can sort of course correct that ethical collection of data and use information about how we're behaving, again, subconsciously and consciously to build a better life for us. And, and I think we need to apply that to uh, something like the built environment where we spend so much of our lives. So I'm tremendously interested in this idea that we can take things like the principles of neuroplasticity and uh, apply it to uh, the physical world or things that might not take that form uh, by itself. So, I mean, have you asked yourself, with all the space that you spend all your time, and have you asked, actually sat down and asked yourself how your life might be better if the building could speak back to you or if the building could make adjustments to make your life better? Um, so let, let's look at a, 
uh, kind of a compli uh, complex uh, concept, so empathy, right? That's something that uh, typically machines can't imitate, but human to human empathy. So if, if one of my friends walked through that door right now, I'm gonna be making some initial observations of how they're carrying themselves. So uh, their, their gait, their speed, how they're moving, um, micro expressions in their face. And let's say that my observation was that my friend or my loved one is sad. Well, social protocol would suggest that I would do something to lift their spirits, right? I would either go up and embrace them with a, a warm hug or exchange kind words. Um, and so uh, what I'm wondering is, is, can we take that same concept of empathy and translate it into a form that uh, isn't required of another agent, and that other agent being a human? And I'm talking a lot about machine intelligence and, and humans. I don't, I, I, I don't inherently l dislike humans. I like... I, I, <laughs> I brought one into the world, but I'm. <laughs> but I, I want to explore this uh, this idea that uh, you know, can we do that with the physical world? And you know, can we imitate that by having the the building around us make these sort of subtle, uh, constant uh, changes, or, or, or uh, you know, use implicit modulation of our physical space to accomplish the same thing? So, I I believe with with things like uh, unobtrusive or truly unobtrusive sensors that are tethered with uh, you know, software that can sort of computationally interpret the same thing that I might be doing uh, you know, watching that, that friend or loved one come in. I believe that we can build, uh, that our building itself can actually intervene and accomplish something similar. So let's say that was me walking through and uh, it knew that, or it had an idea that I was bummed out. As I was walking maybe more towards uh, a window over there and it knew that the shades were down, uh, could it, you know, automatically lift those shades and let more natural light in to improve my mood? Or, um, you know, could it encourage a collaboration with another person in the environment to, to, to boost my mood? So, so you kind of get the idea of um, how, how we can translate that into the physical world. Now, this is a world uh, and that my team and I have been exploring and building already. So what we do is we create these sort of unobtrusive sensors that do a lot of what I've been talking about today. So it gives the physical space the ability to learn about its occupants, and then it's, it's attached to a software that allows multiple people and multiple researchers to understand how the built environment should uh, change in respect to that. So one of my favorite examples of that is uh, what you're looking at here is basically it's, it's a micro environment that was built in a high school. And one of our flagship sensors is a, a flooring sensor. So it's quite literally a subflooring sensor that gets installed underneath or on top of existing flooring. And it basically turns any floor into a touchscreen. So as you're moving through it at a very high level of granularity, but without impeding on privacy, we can understand exactly how people consumed space. And so in this application, uh, what we're looking at is a lot of different sensory artifacts um, of audio, visual, and, and tactile nature um, and what it's doing is, is we're allowing students with autism to walk through this microenvironment uh, without you know, tagging them with some sort of wearable device to get that information, without hovering over them to, to observe them closely. We're letting them experience this environment. And then we're taking that data, and as you can see, we're, we're basically able to identify the exact paths that, that that particular student took if they stopped for a certain period of time, we can take a look at what artifact they looked at. And what researchers are doing now is they're feeding this information back to the school so that the school can build an environment that's more conducive for learning for kids with autism without uh, you know, impeding on their privacy or, or making it uncomfortable for them. And so that, that's just one example. Another example, uh, same type of thing, we're using floor sensors in elderly care facilities. And what you see here is it's being installed in, in the entire um, uh, nursing home facility. And what we're doing is we're using this constant flow of information to be able to eventually predict and prevent a fall from happening versus just detect that it happened. So every day as, th as these patients are walking through, we're getting a better understanding of the degradation of their gait and, and a better understanding of their speed and the relationship of all of those variables so that we can one day be able to say, this person might fall in the next 48 hours because they're exhibiting this type of behavior by the way that they're interacting with the physical space. So I guess my, my main purpose for this is uh, maybe it's a, it's a call to action, but ultimately it's, it's, it's to implore everyone to 
either reignite or adopt a curiosity about uh, how we can interact better with, with our physical construct that we spend so much time with. And it's to, it's to hopefully have everyone challenge our role in the physical environment, our relationship with the physical environment, and improve the function of the built environment that we spend so much time in. Thank you.